as, um, as measured by the uh, electrodes attached to your bodies. No, as measured by Twitter, there was a high degree of uh, engagement in both of those presentations. And uh, if you do have questions for either of these gentlemen or, or both of them, uh, try sending them in the form of a tweet, and I will try to pick them up during our brief but intense conversation of, of what we just heard. But first, we have a question for you, uh, the audience coming off of that panel. And uh, I hope to see it up here momentarily. If you have your, uh, your voting machines at the ready, the question is, coming up shortly, well, I'll tell you what the question is. And if we don't get the votes, here we go. Is engagement more of an art or a science? Number one, if you think it's an art. Number two, if you think it's a science. And then I will ask these gentlemen to comment once everyone has cast their lot. Survey says 68% of you think it's an art, 32% of it think it's a science. Um, I, it, it sounds like uh, both of our presenters are, are on the sides you think they're on, but why don't they just briefly argue their positions? Gerhard, I assume you think engagement is more of an art than a science. Why do you think so? And I should ask, if thinking that, are you interested, are you looking at fMRIs, are you looking at doing the kinds of research sure. uh, that, that, sure. that Carl was talking about? Sure. I think it is an organically growing process. Process. I think it's an organically growing uh, tool. I wouldn't call it just the media because I think social media generally is, is so much bigger than that. But the whole engagement thing, I think one needs to understand and one needs to take the first steps and grow and uh, experience just uh, build your own experience. But I think what makes an art is it is about ideas. It is about getting people excited. It is about creativity. The previous discussion was very interesting because it sounded like there was no more space for creativity. But I think without good ideas, without, um, without uh, great people, without people with dreams, these kind of campaigns can't happen. Having said that, of course, it's, we're a business at the end and we need to sell our products. So I think the measurement side is something that will catch up. We are certainly uh, trying to develop the measurements that we need. But I think at this stage where we are, we've proven that it works. We've proven that we can engage people on a level never before. We must just keep this in mind. This kind of stuff was not possible three years ago. So I think uh, it doesn't negate the role of other media, but I think this is an additional tool an additional way that we never had before. Carl, if it is a science, is it the early days of a hard science like physics, or is it a science like economics? <laughs> uh, somewhere in between. Um, and and I, I, I think actually uh, you know, we should have had a third option, which is both. Um, and, and I think in, in some senses it's a false dichotomy, um, because uh, even the, the hardest science of uh, physics, as you mentioned, um, there's still some creative interpretation at the end of the day you know, when, when you're left with data. So I'd, I'd like to think there's a future where uh, science can be a catalyst for creativity. Um, and I, I also like to think, you know, when I look at Gerhardt's presentation and say, wow, look, look at the magnitude of those effects, you know, what can brain science tell us about what you're seeing? And, and I, I tell people when we do studies, right, we're biometrically monitoring people as they, they view content. Well, what happens at the beginning and the end of every test we do? A person walks in and gives instructions. I will tell you, it is the most engaging part of the session, <laughs> right? The, the human brain is wired for social interaction. How much of your technology, the, the, the technology used, the measurement technology, the, what we know from lie detectors, I mean, you're measuring whether people sweat, whether their heartbeat goes up, is it, is it basically the same thing? But very similar uh, in, in terms of the sensors, yeah. very different in terms of the algorithms, right? right. You know, so for a lie detection, you're, you're trying to trick people and compare you know, when they're telling the truth and answering a question that's not the truth. We're looking at an audience's response to a very specific stimulus, which is the creative. But you get excited in the same way. Uh, Your body responds in the same way to being engaged and to trying to deceive a questioner. Yeah, one of the things that, that um, I, I, I sometimes do when we have more time is I'll actually put the belt on and put it up on, on, on live on the screen and sort of walk through it. Um, and, and it's a very good demonstration of uh, social phobia. 
uh, and, and uh, performance anxiety, because um, my heart rate's very high and you can see these sweats. Uh, but what I like to show is how, how nuanced these things are. I was telling someone earlier, you know, we've seen heart rate increases of 40 beats to program content. Now it's an acceleration, but then it actually comes down very quickly. But that's the equivalent of you know, walking up two flights of stairs. Yeah. Right? People are generating very strong emotional responses to content. What we're doing is looking across the audience and saying, is that happening specifically when you want it to happen, and is it involving the message and the brand? OK, but question. Th sorry, go ahead. No, I just want to emphasize the emotional part also of the response. I think that, uh, that is so, uh, crucial, uh, such a crucial part of the whole art uh, science discussion that you need to first move people. And I think that's also where the role of TV is, is still a very strong, uh, uh, has a very strong role to play. So you really need to move people. If they're not going to be moved, they're not going to be engaged, and they're not going to do um, the kind of stuff that you want them to do. So I think one shouldn't underestimate that. This is, this is a big question, but I think it's really central to this discussion. Is the human brain evolving in response to these rapidly evolving stimuli? That is, are we looking at, are people responding now on your surveys the way they might have responded before the, the internet? And will they be responding in 20 years the same way? Uh, I guess yes and no, yeah. right? So the, the no part is, is, is a little easier. The human brains evolved over tens of millions of years. Uh, it's not gonna change in, in, in 10 decades. Um, that said, the brain is, is so contextually dependent Right, you know the classic studies, Nobel Prize winning studies. You, 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 you know, wouldn't want to tell us at a cocktail party, but if you know, put a cat in a, in a closet during a critical period when their eyes are supposed to be developing, they, they can't see. It's literally a two-week window. That fundamentally changes their brain for their life because they're not getting that visual stimuli. If you take a generation of digital natives and, and give them smartphones and, and surround them in the environment we're in, they're just going to be wired differently than, than you and I are, having having missed that. Um, so yes, their brains will be different, but that's different from evolution, right? Which is, is that going to select out the sort of super users and multitaskers? And that remains to be seen. We don't know who will be selected out, that's the people right. who can do it or the people who can't do it. But, that's exactly right. But Gerhard, I mean, approaching the, you know, the same question from the, uh, from the artist's perspective, uh, do you see change in the speed with which campaigns burn out, sure, with which true. people get, get used to things, get sick of things, and need something yeah. new? Well, I'm not sure if that has really changed, but I think uh, what, what we've learned really with these kind of engagement campaigns is that people want to see an outcome. So if you, if you put something out there and say, guys, we want to do something with you, we've got an idea, we're going to do Katie's uh, video with her, or this guy wants to walk across Austria, it's all fine, but you, couldn't, you can't trick people. They want to see what happened. They want to see the outcome. So I think that's, that's very important, that one then shows them at the end that this is what comes out. And I don't think in terms of campaign length, we've really learned many new things. I think it really depends on so many things, um, GRP levels, it depends on how interesting the product is, how people get engaged. But I think the, the journey that people uh, are on is, is a different thing, and it is all about being involved, doing something. It's not just I'm sitting back and watching an ad. Yeah. Well, if I could build on that, because yeah. I think that's a, a really important piece of the conversation. I said earlier, stories are something that people engage with. Mm. And so that outcome represents mm. essentially the climax of the story, the payoff. Sure. And it's that emotional payoff that triggers the reward centers that get you doing that again. Yeah. Yeah. So in a way, it all does kind of come back to the same journey. How, how much, and this is the last question, because we're going to move on to our, our fast-paced second part of this discussion. But how much are people's emotional responses indicative of their ultimate decision making? I mean, I remember, and my background is covering politics, and I remember when the people meters came in, and everyone got very excited that you could show a political ad or, or a presidential debate to a group of people. CNN sometimes still will, will do this with a live group of people and see the meters spike up when people responded to things. But it never seemed to me to have that much correlation to how they felt a little while later. Right. So, uh, you know, it's a classic question. Um, you have to think that emotions and cognitions are tightly coupled. Um, but if you look at the, the brain and how we've evolved, the emotion centers are, are far more evolved and, and far larger and have been around a lot longer. And they're going to highly influence our, our rational responses. Now, that said, there are all kinds of things that we hear and then make sense of and have an emotional response to. So a great message can trigger an emotional response that then gets us thinking. So it, it, it really is a balance, but if you're going to choose, as I think you articulated well, you know, emotions greater than cognitions, because that's what's, at the end of the day, going to move the needle. Uh, I'm afraid part one is at an end, so please join me in thanking Carl and Gerhardt. Thank